Hi, in today's episode we have Medha Dikshit. Medha is a Bharatnatyam dancer and a rebel with a cause. She is beautiful and Medha began learning Bharatnatyam at the age of 5. Ranga Pravesh in 2002 and she did her PGD in choreography and masters in Bharatnatyam from Shastra University. Medha has traveled across country and she's gone abroad for shows and workshops. The best part about beautiful Medha is the differentiating factor is that she believes in inclusive art forms. So for a Bharatnatyam dancer to be with this thought process is really different. So Medha, tell me about your journey and how did you get into this whole space where you felt that inclusivity which I think is a very very important factor and uh, there should not be any division of anyone wanting to learn an art form. You tell me your work in this field. Hi Mawa, thank you so much uh, for having me on your show. Uh yes, so I was 5 like you said when I started learning Bharatanatyam. And like any other child I used to go to my classes and that was just a very small part of my growing up years. But as I um started understanding dance at a deeper level uh, and started meeting people uh, especially with my travel experiences, my thought towards dance per se changed a lot. uh what i noticed was dance was more for people who could afford who had family support and uh all kinds of privilege but i believe art is not something that can be restricted to just these things and that's when i started thinking about uh anybody should be able, who who wants to dance should be able to dance whoever wishes to express themselves should have that platform Absolutely. i so agree with you yes mm. yes um but but when i thought about this i honestly didn't know where i should start or how i could uh do this or bring a change in uh what i'm pursuing at the moment but uh, what started was initially with the uh, a transgender community um i started uh, working with them in fact that was a very big struggle i had to even talk to them meet them and it was not very easy i had why to, wasn't it easy because they are uh, they are also scared of people they don't yes. know how genuine you are with your thoughts with your because, intentions yeah yeah because mostly people uh, want to extract things from them or uh, for their own benefit uh so it it was very very difficult and it's not easy If at that you know i this was about 12 13 years back when i was quite young uh, i had no support about uh, uh, you know there was no support system who could guide me through these things so i literally went behind them uh, on the street and i went to their uh, places i spoke to them then i got a bunch of people who i started teaching but what prompted you to do this what was that one little incident that made you do this because i have also worked uh, you know we have a common friend anand and i began my first film for durga puja with a film when i had worked with the trans women in bangalore but to me uh, you know how i came about it was this that i saw them very hesitant to enter the puja pandal which i as a bengali used to believe that this is a very very you know it's a community puja and uh, everybody and ev- anybody is allowed in but i saw the security guards not letting them come in and that's when i did my durga puja um you know small film it was really badly made i mean from my side uh, anand did a great job but i spoke so fast because i was so nervous but yes to me when i saw that those the pair of eyes because eyes have no gender emotions have no gender and they were not allowed in and uh, so for me that was the experience and that's for no fault of theirs no fault at all no fault at all and i'm really hoping things are changing of course now is getting right. it's getting better right i think the pandemic has done good things to people also there's been an awakening that right. we are so transient everything is you know we are not um, invincible right and uh, you know you might just because i've lost a few friends also during this pandemic and uh, i just feel that you know how much ever love we have to give within us it's and i think also as a creative person the more love and emotion we have and we can spread that out our art gets better absolutely yeah? absolutely so meeta tell me that incident that had happened for you what was that turning point for you to think about trans women to be because you know when you learn bharatnatyam you're such a puritan you know and you're only going to stick to the 
age old traditional way of doing dance so how and what was that trigger i do have a few seniors who have worked with visually challenged physically uh, challenged or specially able children and adults so when i was thinking about it um i thought yes there are ngos there are people who support uh, these groups but uh, what about these women you know the trans women who are who we see on street uh, like i mentioned earlier i find them uh, very interesting because particularly from dance per se because see dance is a beautiful amalgamation of shiva and shakti yes and there can't be a better person to dance than them is something i felt yeah so we need to explain actually to our listeners uh, because we have so many people who are also not from india what is it that's the shiva and the shakti shiva is the masculine form yes, and, and shakti, shakti is, is the, the feminine, feminine form. form and the two mixing together which is so beautiful it's yes. a union and the concept of ardhanarishwara is yes. a it's a very popular concept we have in yeah. india uh, so this is actually not something alien to us absolutely not when no, we talk about not. the age old practice they have always been respected and these concepts have always been spoken about even in dance we do a lot of compositions on ardhanarishwara and that's when this thought came to me why is that they are always pushed away and and i see them in fact what triggered me was also when i was in one of the signals i saw them dancing then that's that's when i this thought this is a very colonial thing by the way this is very yes it's yes. a very colonial thing it is not at all an indian system of not having uh, trans uh, people very much a part and parcel of our lives this was something that was completely you know hot over and they were uh, really cast aside and uh, they from there on i mean there was no looking back because all of us i think at a certain point in our lives we did emulate uh, what the colonial people had left for us yes i think that's when even this uh, whole thing about privileged society getting into dance came in uh, which was not very prevalent before that so we were always a very inclusive society that's how i got in touch with them and i started working with okay. them and uh, i when i was doing my masters my dissertation work was also about aravanis and their art forms and dance in aravani community aravani community yes so even in uh, the trans women uh, there are a lot of um, umbrella terms uh, even i am not very sure about those yeah. like there are jog- jogatis and there are aravanis and so there are many of them um, so i got to work with few of them but this was this didn't uh, happen for a very long time i had to stop it due to my own reasons but after 10 years now again i'm trying to get in touch with them for the same reason uh, but like you mentioned i think things are changing today so this is just one part of it when i say inclusivity so there are so many other things about dance uh, like even men dancing boys dancing which uh just the fact that when, when somebody says their son is learning dance uh they 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 would probably pass a very very fleetingly pass a comment are you trying to be a girl by dancing why do you want to learn dance oh yes absolutely you can say and that and they again. want to give them names like you're not going to grow up to be a normal boy so these kind of terms i think are very disrespectful it is uh so inclusivity is about caste class gender all of these it's beyond i would say it's beyond uh the societal boundaries that we have it's beyond the physical body that we have and how many students do you have who are boys in your class not even one Oh dear really not even one i have about 75 students and they're all girls all of them are girls in fact i push them like i push parents to send their sons you know there are siblings the girls usually come to class i push them there are kids who are interested i have seen because when the sister is dancing i see the little ones or their older brother dancing and uh, especially now with pandemic everything going online i keep seeing them dancing in the at hall the you know behind <laughs> at the back and i i talk to their i talk to their parents i i tell them why don't you send 
and then uh, they are like they just laugh it off even though the child so is sad. interested sometimes you know the, the daughter might not be interested at all but yes it's a very um, cliche that the girls have to learn dance and boys have to do, do something very masculine and so tell me when you say that you know what you need to have uh, monetary and you need to be monetarily uh, stable to be able to take on dance form as a full time profession why do you say that and from where does that statement come because i agree with you and i have been struggling for so many years to even find that sense of validity for uh, my work because i think everybody uh, equates um, work based on money and how successful you are monetarily and for artists of course the first thing we didn't uh, we're made to we're told that oh you've been given a stage and that's more than enough and people have come to watch you and uh, money is not even something that is discussed and uh, so uh, tell me a little bit about this part i'm sure you would have gone through some experiences that were heartbreaking harrowing i can imagine because <laughs> i mean you know to learn how to dance you're going against your physical you're going against your uh, physical body and you're you know you're even if you're tired you have to go through the whole physical uh, part of dancing just to justify that is so painful to me so tell me how did you kind of uh, overcome all these challenges meeta i don't think i've overcome but <laughs> i have found my ways definitely see it starts right from learning an art form it's it's uh, it it doesn't come free you have to pay the guru dakshina it starts from there and uh, i won't say it's wrong because as a guru you know as a teacher that's that's their living but once you take this as a profession you have to make your earning through this you have your rents to pay you have your bills to pay now how do you earn this like you rightly mentioned everybody wants you to perform and they very casually say or uh, make you feel nice saying yes you've got the big platform that you wanted now this is going to give you name right but what what will it give me other than name my name is not going to feed me so people who have a strong economic background definitely can survive i mean so are you telling me that people who actually do not have uh, you know um they are not probably accountable to pay up at home and uh, they are the ones who are pursuing uh, art forms and not dance, not no? really see there are a lot of dancers in spite of all these struggles they still pursue i think it's only because of the passion that they have they find their ways to uh, earn teaching is probably one of the popular ways especially in classical dance form that you earn but anything else is like a charity but my question is why if somebody is organizing a performance uh yeah i mean see once a while i understand but every time it's not no even when you say once a while but i have a question i mean do you go to a doctor and say just once in a while treat me free you know do you even go to a chartered accountant and say you know just do my accounts and you know for exactly. so the next account i will pay you you don't yeah. i don't know why is it this I that they some... do that with us you know i was a right to face this like tremendously they will tell me I that i remember one of your posts about this oh my <laughs> <laughs> i was so angry about it you yes, know yes yes that you know if you're you know it's like when you go into a restaurant you're asking for you know there are different prices to it so why would you allow me to tell you okay you know what a 10000 word uh, article is going to cost you this much and that one will cost you that that much no they don't get that they yeah. just feel that they're giving me like a huge opportunity and i don't want your opportunity because i think i know how to write if i am saying yes to you for your brand i i will know what to do with it right so it's very difficult i and i mean hats off i know one can't overcome that unless you become such a big uh, artist or there's right. a corporate house that promotes uh, and to you. Be, and to to grow there the route you have to take is not easy at oh, all it's daunting meeta you're walking on a path of thorns correct yes yeah so i think that is where um of course there's a lot of discrimination even in um with regard to caste class there's a lot of what do you mean by caste and 
class i mean class there is there is a lot of discrimination mm-hmm. in terms of uh, pre- you know uh, preference given to uh, people Brahmin? coming from higher castes okay and us with certain looks uh, the way they are treated there are there is a lot of politics involved but what we see today why we still have so many dancers uh, is because i think it's they, they it's the passion that they have that yeah, you don't uh, know how to do anything else yeah like i don't know how, what to do without writing it without doing podcasting yes. or gi- giving a voice i don't know what else yes. to do any longer right and now uh, there are few dancers from heritage community who are speaking out and talking about it which i think we were not even aware uh, so what in, do you mean by that so there's a lot of uh, the, the political scenario that i told is not even something which was discussed earlier uh, but today yes like i said there are voices who um, they are, are opening up and talking yes they are opening up and talking about it uh, which was also an eye opener for me uh, otherwise for us everything looks rosy and nice from the outside world but every dancer have their own struggle uh, see i mean da- i am a dancer and i'll talk about dance as such because dance is not something where you just go perform as a dancer you need to know music you need to know lighting you need to know marketing you need to know um so you need you need to learn literature and all these won't come easy you have to spend hours on these and uh, you have to spend on your costume you have to spend so when you're performing it's not just you like i said you you need to have good quality of music or have live musicians come and sing for you and accompany you so there is so much more to a dancer than just performance that is really tough meena it is so this is where the challenges come for uh you know somebody who is trying to make a name in the dance field uh yes today we have social media mm, the positive side of it is people who are really working hard are getting a platform oh for sure i think it is radical Yes, Meeta, it is radical according to me. I know a lot of people might really say, "Oh, you know what? You need a digital detox." Surely we do, and we shouldn't be stuck to our phones all the time. And you know, because that has all the social media platforms. But you know, the number of photographers, dancers, artists, singers—they're all getting. You don't have to pay to be inside a hall. You know, you don't need to get correct, a, a correct. exhibition hall where you need to pay. Yes, so many people can't. Yes, and you, in fact, I uh, honestly, Mahwa, it's been few years now. that um i have been very strict about it and upright about if they don't pay me i am not going to perform and they have to cover my i just at began. least my expenses of that performance you know no, if if because every performance i can't end up shelling out from my pocket i don't have anything in my pocket to shell out and how do i perform unless i perform i don't get a name but now i think i have moved on from there i don't uh and my idea of dancing has gone beyond performance so i What am working by that yes so i call it um, beyond the proscenium which is something i have been working on for some time like i said one is about inclusivity so i uh, i do work with special children um and uh, and how is that experience meeta it's beautiful it's 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 so pure because there is no expectation of what is going to come out from that class it's that moment that they rejoice and it's that moment i enjoy unlike so many other classes where this happens and this has to end up with a performance end up with a competition end with a exam none of these are attached no no strings attached to this so recently i also started teaching uh, a bunch of women who are over 50 wow and they have never danced in their life and it's only because they just wanted to try in fact we had a online performance and they were so thrilled i i could see the child in them you know yeah that, oh my that god innocence. you just say that again and again that child in us yeah the the oldest i have right now is a 60 year old who's come wow out. and i think i'm really enjoying being with these offbeat circle of people because like i said there are no strings attached to this it's that moment of joy and after every class when they reach out to you and say 
uh, this was so nice and this is what I want to learn next. Can you teach me something like this? And for them, it's pure joy and pure happiness. Nothing beyond that. And that I think to you is such a fulfilling moment. Am absolutely, I right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So that is where I see dance going beyond stage or the, beyond performance. So the other work I have also been doing is with uh, education. Mm, I have worked with a few alternate schools, not the mainstream schools, where I have tried to create certain syllabus and uh, work in sync with what they teach in school. So these are things that I absolutely love doing. It's so it's not just performance alone. Performance, I to me at the moment is just one very small part of it. Okay, this now you've spread yourself uh, in in so many other areas where you are actually also experiencing yourself as I can see it in your eyes. Yes, and I learn. In fact, I think that's a greater joy. There's so much that I get to learn when I'm involved in an environment that I'm not used to. Oh, yes. You're challenging your own self when right. you're in an environment like that. So, Meeta, just tell me a little bit about the fact that, you know, I mean, dance to me is all about fitness and about a body that has to be completely like agile and you need to have really high energy levels. Uh, being a mother, how difficult was that for you? You know, I mean, you did go through nine months of not being able to dance, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. And then also our bodies just change after you've given birth. And, you know, you as a woman, so many times I know people are really now talking about the fact that I love my stretch marks because, you know, it shows okay. that I've been a mother. But I don't think I could say that when I had uh, my stretch marks on my stomach because to me... I just didn't recognize my body, you know, mm -hmm. after I had delivered. And that itself was such a shocker because um, I don't think we were uh, even educated enough mm -hmm. to know mm -hmm. that all these things And body shaming happen. was very common then. Oh, extremely common. It is. It was extremely common that time. Yeah. 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 And uh, so how did you uh, kind of those nine months that you did not do any form of dance, I'm sure. Uh, how did you cope up with the whole, the entire changing? I mean, motherhood itself is such a... It's it's such an awakening, I think, you know, when you become a mother, you suddenly start realizing that you love somebody much more than yourself, which right. you've never known ever before. Right. And, you know, we've spoken about it in the past. And uh, so, how was that? So, my pregnancy was quite nice, I would say, because I uh, kept teaching. I also did a couple of performance. Uh, in fact, I danced in my eighth month of pregnancy also. Wow, really? And were you allowed to do that? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, I used to practice yoga along with dance. And uh, it was quite comfortable. So when I say dance, it was not a very uh, energetic one. It was a soft, subtle dance that I did. But I did. I was not away from dance at all. Um, in fact, just till about 10 days before my delivery, I used to travel and take classes and come back. But what changed was post-pregnancy which I never expected. Uh, people had told me, but I think till you experience yourself, uh, <laughs> you don't know what, what is uh, waiting for you. So, uh, so true. post-delivery, I did go through uh, postpartum depression. I don't think we even knew, you know, that uh, people do get depressed. Right. I didn't know. Right. And I was depressed. And I think there was a mother a long time back. She had just delivered a child and she gave me a call. And she said, I want to talk to you. And I said, uh, I said, hey, how are you doing? You just become a mother. She said, you know, I remember when people were congratulating you. You didn't say thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I'm feeling completely lost. And I want to ask you, is it okay to feel like that? And by then I was already, you know, like four years into my motherhood journey. Oh. <laughs> and I said, oh, really? I didn't say thank you. She said, no, you were looking cross with everybody who was talking to you. Yeah, I so, think accepting something post-delivery, accepting your body, accepting the whole change that has happened, uh, even, I mean, you become responsible for, for another being, an, another human being there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, anything goes wrong, it's because of you. I mean, people very conveniently point at you. So physically and mentally, it was extremely challenging because for someone like me who have always traveled, been very active, just to tie me down in, uh, you know, in a room and uh, I was asked to look after the child. I mean, it was not even asked. It 
I had to. I had no choice. Yeah, yeah. As much I loved being a mother, I loved uh, being with my baby. It was very difficult. So what happened was um, about uh, five six months post pregnancy, I got an opportunity to perform for National Doordarshan. Till then, I was um, not even aware that my grade, I, so A grade, is uh, for the National Doordarshan. I was a B grade artist, that is the state Doordarshan, but. Uh, um, I had received a letter about few months back. I had not seen the letter, and they gave me a call asking if I could do a recording in next twenty days. And getting an opportunity to record for National Doordarshan, uh, it's not very often we get that. It's very very rare, in fact. If I reject, I don't I don't know when I'm going to get it next. And uh, I said yes. Till then, I had not moved at all. Your body, yeah. Um, oh God. Yeah, because I didn't have a natural delivery, and uh, in spite of being quite active. Um, so I I had to take time to heal, and then just in twenty days I had to prepare myself for one hour of recording, and that had to be like a traditional, very energetic performance. So I did it. I recorded. After that, my health started deteriorating because I had not taken enough rest. I started having knee issues. So a lot of health issues started cropping up. And that's when I started. I did excruciating backache. Not me at all. Yes. This is just not me. Somebody who could jump from here to there. I am not able to move now. So, for um, you know, somehow I pushed two years of post pregnancy. But after that, I just couldn't do anything. I think that was the worst phase of my life. After two years, about another two three years of my life was pretty bad because I really didn't know what happened and. doctors told me i have to undergo surgery they said i may not be able to dance again at all my depression uh, just got more deeper and stronger <laughs> uh but you've obviously completely recovered i can see that yeah i think it was not something that happened overnight it took me a long while to do that i tried a lot of things i went to i mean i i did take help i went to a healer i i spoke to therapists and uh I started doing yoga, which changed a lot in me. Mm-hmm. And I started slowly working on my fitness, my eating habits, my lifestyle. I had to change everything, but I think everything happened for good. So today, um, I might not be as fit as I was before, but definitely at a very happy space where I can I can perform, I can do what I want to do. Uh, so you know it. I I have taken my steps to be where I am, and uh, I think we have we have only two choices: either we stay there and struggle and keep cribbing about it, or work on it and get out of it. It absolutely, I'm a complete believer of that because for me, I'm rebooting myself after so many years. I think about ten to twelve years of no work whatsoever, and entering a space that is full of youngsters. and uh, somebody who's never even been on nash- you know on uh, any sort of um, media uh, social media and so you know just navigating the whole thing itself is so daunting but i'm so glad i decided to not just vegetate and say ah okay you know right yeah but of course it needed me to really re- uh, there've been tears that i've shed there have been sleepless nights and which i've thought oh my god why am i doing this why am i like this why do i feel yes. so much yes. and uh, but you know today i'm also glad like if there are seven days in a week there are four days that i would feel no okay no four days there would be two days in a week where i feel that oh god why do i feel so much towards things but the other days i'm so glad that i can feel because out of that comes the art you know right. the ability to understand to to give the best to your work you know so yeah So coming back to uh, Meeta, tell tell me a little about you know I remember we were talking last time and there are some parts of literature that have like really played a huge impact uh, on you on and, and those you have imbibed in your dance form. So it'd be lovely for our listeners to know about uh, you know some of the parts of literature that has uh, shaped up some of your dance performances. Um, one literature I absolutely love is uh, Sri Jay Deva's Ashtapadi. uh that has been my uh, all time favorite and uh, i have worked on a few of them uh the it's kind called of called shri jayadeva's ashtapadi ashtapadi okay and what is it all about so this is about krishna and radha's oh, uh, love <laughs> and 
I mean, I have tried reading it many times. Every time I see something new in that and uh, anybody speaking about it, I love listening to it. Um, the kind of romance that is described, I don't think I have watched it or heard it in any movie or any novel, uh, at least in the ones that I have uh, come Which across. Which part touched you the most? The last part of the Ashtapadi where... Uh, so the whole Ashtapadi is about uh, Radha waiting. I mean, in a very simpler form. And Krishna has told he's going to meet her at some point of time in during that night. And she keeps waiting and he doesn't turn up. And uh, she uh, gets to know that he's with another group of women. And she gets so angry. She gets frustrated. She cries. I mean, she... Um, this, there's so many variations of emotions that we see that she goes through, like shades of emotions. And then when he comes, they have a whole conversation, they fight, they love, so many things happen. And towards the end of it, she's so angry, she doesn't want to forgive him for all that he has done. And um, he just, he's Krishna and he still takes her feet and puts it on, puts it on his head and he says, can you please forgive me? And she just melts there. That's, I think that's like the ul ultimate yeah, I get romance. The yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah. I. So you know, this whole thing is very, very beautiful. So I just love this. Uh, Look at your eyes <laughs> getting glassy. So it's mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So apart from this, one more than literature, I would say a lot of poetry. Um, and I, I love exploring poetry from different languages. Okay. Like I have worked on uh, a Bengali song. Um, I have worked on a Odia song. I have worked on uh, Marathi songs. Uh, Bridge Basha. Bridge Basha, of course, has been popular in mm. poetry. Uh, even from Karnataka, I have tried working on different uh, accents. So, you know, we have different yes, flavors absolutely. of Kannada here. Yeah. So I love working on uh, poetry from different languages. Okay. Um, as diverse as they are, we can see a lot of uh, common interests or especially when we go back in history. Um, Bhakti movement is one uh, thing that I have worked on. And when I was working on this particular topic, uh, I started picking poetry from various parts of India. And what was common, there was no social media, there was no network, there was no uh, human connection was only, I mean, it people could not connect from one state to another as easily as we could, we can oh, today. Absolutely. <laughs> but the content of the poetry are so similar uh, in, in the way the language, I mean, when I say language, not the language, but the kind of vocabulary that is used and the intent of the poetry, they are so similar. And these are some things that uh, catch my interest. And I love to work on these kind of projects. Oh, how wonderful is that? How wonderful is that? Way? So, so tell me now, Medha, that where do you see yourself taking this now with the pandemic? I'm sure a lot of you've been doing online and online is definitely not like the way it is to do. Because I've seen you perform in Coven <laughs> Park with, uh, you know, with all the children, in the open air and uh, that one-on-one -on -one interaction is obviously lesser. Correct. So how does that affect your art form? We've gotten um, used to it, all of us, I know. But that initial <laughs> stage, how Yeah, is so it? initially, I refused to take class. For three months, we, we just stopped everything. Because I was very positive that it's going to uh, yeah, all <laughs> go away and we'll all be back to class. Um, yeah, but I, I think... I think we're very <laughs> negative now. Because we really do. Everybody's talking about the third wave. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. So, uh, yeah. Uh, but after three months, then I had no choice but to start back classes online. That way, I think uh, I have to be so grateful to technology because of which we were able to continue uh, our the classes. Uh, classes. And um, initially, it was really difficult. Um, I would struggle because I'm not somebody who is used to sitting in front of a la laptop and I never imagine myself being there at any point of time. Uh, in my life like I mean I might use a device for certain um, activities but not for class definitely not for my work at least so it was very difficult eventually we start I mean I would say we because it was only because of my students 
I was also able to come up with um, various ways of communicating, uh, teaching, and uh, various methods so that we don't miss out too much on what we used to do in class. Okay. So now it's been a year. And I would say now I think we are at that phase where we are definitely comfortable with the setting we have. Of course, it's not the best uh, as good as a physical uh, meet. But I mean, I would say when something closes, there's something that opens up. And, Absolutely. And uh, we only have to wait for it. We don't know when that's going to happen. But I see what I thought a year ago was everything is shut. And I don't know, this is just a temporary setting that I have. And there are a few students who quit because parents felt this is not the way they want their kids to learn. And I mean, it's understandable that that's how they want their kids to learn. But today, I see there are other things that have opened up. Now, because of uh, the online structure that we have, anybody from any corner of the world can learn. Yeah, which is so amazing. Which is so and amazing. And have you had students from out of uh, India? Yes. Wow, so, that's um, nice. In fact, a lot of my old students, I okay. started teaching in 2005, mm -hmm. about 16 years back. Um, so they, uh, they all went abroad uh, to study. They got married. Some of them uh, got married. And they so wanted to continue. And when I just reached out to them, said, what do you think if I you know, want to take a class, uh, just online class. They were so happy. They said, in, you know, th this is something we um, always wanted, but we didn't know how to continue. And some of them are working full time. Now what? A lot of them attend from their own office. Uh, so they have, they have the freedom to attend class from wherever they are. Yes. <laughs> which is a very, very big plus point. It's a huge plus point. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, and also the way we interact with others, it's so easy to connect with another artist. So this is the positive side of online or the virtual sessions that we are having. No doubt, like I said, physical class or having, uh, you know, especially with kids, uh, having kids around you is the best part of my class. I always, and because those cuddles, those hugs, when they just come and jump on you and, you know, it's it's so amazing. Those are the things I terribly miss. And is your son also going to learn dance? Ah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if he wants to, I'll be more than happy. <laughs> okay, that's wonderful. That's yeah, wonderful. but it's, it's at home. He keeps watching. So I hope that he's going to take it up sometime. But, yeah, totally up to him. <laughs> Before I end the episode, I would like to remind you of a line that you'd said to me and that stayed back with me saying that your best friend is your dance. Like my best friend is my pen. Correct, correct, <laughs> it correct. It just goes with me. I know that come what may, the people may leave me and people may go and I may be heartbroken and dejected, but my pen will never ever let me down. And in the same way, your feet will never let you down. Oh, so true, so true. Because... Um, you know, the reason I feel that is wherever I go, I'm recognized as a dancer. And without that, I don't know if I have any identity. And I feel so proud of who I am and uh, who I am because of dance. So I'm so grateful for this best friend that I have with me. Yes, me too. Yeah, <laughs> I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. So uh, wherever I go, wherever I am, whatever mood I am in dances with me. So, How are you so beautiful, Mida? What is it that you do your uh, skin care tips in your... like you have always complimented and I think that smile just so brings that. Everybody would be saying that to you to those beautiful dancer <laughs> eyes that are expressive. It's full of expression and you are gorgeous, Mida. Thank you so much for being in this episode today and uh, if people were to look out for your classes... Where can they find you? If you can just share with us your phone number, your Instagram yeah. handle, your social media account, how? Yeah. So before I give out that, I just want to say something, Mahua. I have um, been in a couple of interviews uh, on uh, social media. But honestly, not something... I mean, we generally discuss about my journey as a dancer, where I have performed and things like that. But this is something I will cherish because uh, you've probably brought out so many things I have never spoken about. Uh, 
So thank you so much uh, for doing this uh, recording thank with me. Thank you so much, Medha. Uh, that has was... touched my heart. I, I've tried to stop a tear from falling on the side of my eye, but thank you so very much. Thank you. Yeah, I think the way you take the interview or the way you speak, it's so beautiful. I just... Uh, I, I you you just make me speak. It, it's as simple as that. I don't have to think too much. <laughs> <laughs> like I always say that vulnerability is strength. And you know, it's I think in the pandemic, I think more and more people should recognize that because the more you are vulnerable with each other, you will make better friends. People will connect with you because I don't think anybody is there who's perfect. Each of us are flawed. Right. Each of us I have got challenges. I don't think there's any concept as perfect at yeah, all. <laughs> yeah, but then we try to always, you know, project that there is perfection in our lives. Perfect marriage, perfect husband, perfect children, perfect career, perfect everything. Right. And which is not actually the reality. Right. So thanks once again, Medha, and share yeah. with us. Yeah. So my, uh, you can reach out to me on my uh, WhatsApp number. That is 98459-295958. And uh, my Insta handle is Medha underscore Dakini. M-E-D-H-A underscore D-A-K-I-N-I. That is my Insta handle. Uh, you can also mail me at uh, swastiart at gmail.com. That How is my foundation. Swasti? Yeah, S-V-A-S-T-I-A-R-T. Swastiart at gmail.com. So that is my uh, Swasti Art Foundation is my dance school. So yes, I can be reached on any of these. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mawa. Thank you so much. To you, our dearest listeners, you can find us on your favorite streaming services. Find us on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcast, and of course, all other major streaming services. With loads of love, we are Moody Mawa's podcast, where Hatke is hot. Hot.